we have been through wintering. We have dove into the importance of tending to soil, which is also a metaphor and a way of approaching organizational development that is key to regenerative leader. What is the cultural soil of my community, of my organization? We have dove into becoming a good ancestor and, and that legacy and our role in the greater tapestry of life in the greater tapestry, tapestry of our lineage. And today we are tuning into the story of separation. What is the essence of a regenerative leader? What is the root of the dysfunctional systems and structures that we need to address as regenerative leaders? What is the root cause of those? And how can we consciously sit with that, address that head on without shying away from it? Um, and last year when we did sort of like a, the first check-in brief survey, um, there was a few that commented on why we had to go so dark and deep from the beginning of our journey. Um, so I, I, I think some of you may feel the same. And the reason is that um, I want to make sure that I do my little bit, bit to, to help ensure or at least hold space for the fact that we can't run the risk of regeneration, regenerative leadership, regenerative organizational development, regenerative business becoming just the next kind of superficial fat where, where it's all about tapping into the wisdom of life, learning from nature, biohacking, bio-inspired innovation without us also daring to sit with the root cause of the current dysfunctional systems and structures. We need to dare go there or else it's just superficial scaffolding on a fragile foundation. We have to go there. It has to be woven into how we redesign systems and structures and how we show up as leaders of, of from all walks of life. So that's why it has to be, in my opinion, put front and center so that we can weave this in when we are talking about principles of life, ecosystemic mapping, biomimicry, et cetera. We have this as our shared backdrop of, of wisdom and knowledge, and we have sat with this. Um, because as I said, we can't just bulldoze our way forward. We can't run the risk of, 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 of this field being yet another superficial uh, field where a whole world of new fancy consultancy are popping in and, 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 and putting the word regeneration to it without actually having sat with some of the deeper components of this field. We need to move away from superficial solutioneering. I don't know if it's a word, but let's make it one. We need to stop scaffolding eagerly on a fragile foundation and we can't continue bulldozing our way forward. So that is the reason why. And, um, and this is not just le about learning a new style of leadership. It's a new level of consciousness. It's letting go of what no longer serves. And we are in this community um, fumbling and chaotically. And uh, sometimes it feels like this gooey, messy face of metamorphosis. We are, we are finding the answers together, integrating, implementing, holding space for what needs attention in our own way. So it's a new level of consciousness in many ways that we are tapping into. It's not a certification in a new leadership style. Um, I, hope, I hope that's clear. So the, so the foundation for regenerative leadership is to heal the story of separation and weave that into everything that we do and understand the root cause of it, also understand the history of it. Um, and a bit of a disclaimer, is that our session today and the pre-recorded modules and, 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 and what I present is presented through a Eurocentric lens. And the reason um, that is the case is that I believe that we need to go to the root cause of colonialism, of capitalism, power over dynamics, um, to understand where it came from. It's also the fact that I am a white European, so that will be the lens. So that's a disclaimer that, um, that I have to put out there. 
also the disclaimer that this is such a complicated field we are tapping into with so many nuances, so many layers. And this is just one version of a translation of a lot of different fields and historians work and, um, and philosophy, etc. So it will always be subjective. So that is just a, a disclaimer. In the living library that we invite you into next week, there is a lot of delicious resources in the in the in the topic called um, healing the story of separation. So there's a lot for you to explore and dive deeper into and and digest um, so that you are able to give your version of that uh, that is filtered through your lens. A final warning is that um, today can't be potentially triggering to some if this is new it will be triggering and how can we hold space for that within us and take self-responsibility for that because be, be, before we are kind of lashing all kinds of things out so i hope that was enough of a of a warning and let's dive into let's dive into the content of the session you've seen this before at least a version of it um if you've gone through the pre-recorded versions of the of the module and i also mentioned that briefly in our last session but for the majority of the time we were here on this planet as a species we have been through the lunar era this indigenous worldview this indigenous worldview of seeing everything as interconnected seeing your role as being stewards of life custodians of life seeing everything alive as your siblings your brothers and sisters and you treat it that way and um god is everywhere the earth the planet is our mother so we tend to the earth, to our planet, as we would tend to and care for our mother. And we are her children. Life is to be celebrated, both the beginning of life and the end of life. De de death, death is the foundation for new life to flourish and blossom. It's the compost that generates the new energy for new life to flourish. It's not something to be feared. And the cultural hero, um, regardless of, of, of where we can trace mythical stories and, and understandings throughout this planet, has been one of the shaman. That shaman that was holding space for questions to, to be explored. That shaman who wandered off into the underworld to bring back messages to his or her community, their community. Um, and that started to shift in myths and storytelling and in our society, um, regardless of where we can trace it all over the world. This is, this is not a European phenomenon. This shift from the lunar era to the solar era is something we can trace back to, um, to, to societies all over the planet. So the, the myths in the cultural um, or, and the cultural hero of the solar era was the warrior, the king. But there also started to, to sneak in this fear of death, this fear of darkness. So we had to enter into war with ourselves, with our community, with others, so that we could eradicate darkness um, and bring in the light. And nature was something to observe and maybe dominate. It was not necessarily a part of us. We started to celebrate the outstanding individual, something that would never happen in the lunar era where we were a community. And life began and ended with our, the well-being of our community. That started to shift in the solar area. And so did this, um, in the beginning, slow, but increasingly division between men and women. And God was no longer something that was present everywhere. It was more this notion of a um, father sky, this the, the father in the sky, this creator of, um, of everything. So in this era, there was this obsession with building kingdoms and empires and owning land and taking over land. Um, in many cultures, there was still a presence of the goddesses, and there was still a strong connection to nature. 
but that then started to 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 change and there started to be um, this criticism especially in the beginning among the elite the elite took on board this new christianity and the elite writers were mocking those that had multiple gods and goddesses the pagans of the time and that was um regardless of where we were this mockery of uh, a polytheistic approach to life and um, i showed you this the last time as well where and this is important because Augustine was really the foundation of a lot of our biblical textures um, and, and in many ways still today and the father of biblical writings. Um, and this was his approach that he was kind of kind of or directly mocking um, what he called pagans. And as we also talked about last last time, what does it do to our shared understanding of life when for such a long time, those that were holding the biblical, biblical scriptures, the monasteries, the monks who were writing down our history, when they were directly told to ensure they eradicated everything that um, said something about nature being holy, nature being enchanted, something about goddesses, something about the feminine that all had to be eradicated. And what I shared last time was that you can see they have two writing utensils and one is actually a knife. So that is, that is the knife eradicating everything that has to do with nature being sacred. Um, and churches will build upon pagans, holy fountains or oaks, etc. And, and pagan festivities were replaced with, with, with Christian festivities. And then a long period followed where um, there was a slow change in, 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 in allowing to question more of these biblical scriptures. And um, there was a new kind of face shift in a way where, um, where the women were celebrated again to a greater extent. And the notion of something that, that had a goddess-like status were present. We saw more and more communities, and again, this is a Eurocentric uh, point of view, more and more communities in Europe where uh, that was built on, on matriarchs and on, on women primarily. And we have also seen, many of you have probably heard the story of Shandak, who was this young goddess-like figure who were by the king um she, she was kind of uh, being nominated to lead an army and suddenly she got too powerful and um and 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 she was um, she was killed because she was she was too powerful and this figure is showing the little ice age which was happening at the same time and those of you that have watched the module will will know that this was an an, an important epoch for us as a um, as 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 humans and ha has played an important part of the structure of our societies that we have today because this was a period where there was a lot of famine a lot of disease a lot of frustration um, a lot of turmoil was happening in 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 many parts of Europe um, and as you will know 25 years into this little ice age to address this challenge and problem, the Pope issued this executive order demanding that all so-called witches, um, which were both men and women that had a close connection to nature were put on trial so that we as a society could extract knowledge and wisdom from these women, but also so that we could eradicate them. Um, and two years after this Pobo Bull, uh, that there was the launch of the book called Malleus Maleficarum, also called The Hammer of Witches, which became a middle age um, bestseller. It was incredibly popular and it's horrifying. You can still buy that book online. And when you read that, it's utterly horrifying. It's detailed descriptions of how to torture women to get knowledge out of them how to um, realize that women are here to tempt you and they are here as an obstacle for men's through true holiness 
um, and that women are constantly tempting us in their devilish ways and therefore they need to be suppressed and dominated and if they don't know their rightful play place in society we need to torture them to get to kind of constrain them and 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 make sure they know of their rightful place that is our our job as men to correct this wildness in our society because look where that got us we are starving there is a lot of friction in villages and cities we need to address this it was also that period that really wove, wove in a lot of fear a lot of shame and guilt around who you truly were, who you truly were, your sexuality, your desires, your connection to nature was seen as illegal, and and really started this um, very long period. It wasn't just a year. It wasn't just a decade. It was three centuries of brutal interrogations, torture, and killing of uh, of both men and women, but primi primarily women. Um, and the, the thing is that it was even illegal to have a record of how many women had been killed in your village. If it was discovered that you were keeping a record of that, you would be killed as well. So we don't know the exact amount of women and men that got killed during this, those three uh, centuries, but it's a lot. Um, in some cases, entire villages got eradicated. And it was justified with this notion that we need to correct and we need to bring ourselves back to center, that we have come astray. And now we are being, um, God is punishing us um, by not delivering um, fertile harvests, et cetera. So even helping a so-called witch or having a mole, having a birthmark, having a cat, um, brewing chamomile tea if you had a sore throat could mean the end of your life. Um, so, so imagine this, um, this incredible, I, I don't even think we can imagine the amount of fear and stress and utter horror it, it, it was to live in, in this epoch. Um, and it was primarily uh, the poorest women and men that uh, that got killed and eradicated and brutally tortured and you were in your right to torture uh, women and men if you had a suspicion that they knew too much about the cycles of nature about plant medicine midwives got eradicated all over europe as well because they were working with plant medicine and they were working um they were being too wise um and and how can we sit with what how that has caused this this wound this chasm in our collective psyche and and understand how that has also caused a lot of fear of being of standing out of speaking your truth um a uh, fear around gossiping or being called out so much fear so much desperation. Um, and Gregory Silborg has written about this epoch in his great masterpiece, The History of Medical Psychology. And he states, never in history of humanity was women more systemically degraded. And in this case, systemically is the key word because women and men has been degraded and tortured before and after, but this was systemically in a way we haven't seen before and after to this extent. And what, wh how, how has that created this chasm in our collective psyche? What has it done to us is something that we need to sit with as regenerative leaders. This fear of the feminine, this fear of knowing about nature's ways, this fear of a cyclical approach to life, this fear of nature being more than just matter. So for six or seven generations, children saw their mothers being burned at the stake. How has that been woven into our collective DNA and this living in constant fear? And this was also present in the scientific community. And 
um, and science were were also told to behave in a certain way if if they wanted to be able to express their insights. And quite a few scientists, um, male, were also brutally tortured at the time. Um, Bruno, who, there's a statue still of him in um, in Rome, was questioning the masculinity of the Holy Trinity. Is that really true that that it has that masculine character? He was questioning um, why nature couldn't be a feminine energy, and he was weaving in new ways into his scientific findings. And for that, he was um, he, he was called a blasphemist, and he was interrogated for seven years until he was also brutally killed. And at the time, it was seen as as you helping to get rid of evil in your society if you were witnessing the brutal torture. So if you showed up for this brutal torture and killing in villages all over Europe, you were helping to get rid of evil. That was something that was being, being praised and set, um, set in church. How can we sit with this? How can we sit with the fact that uh, the the, the so-called father of the scientific method, Francis Bacon, that these are some of the words and his approaches. And he was also a legal prosecutor and he was heading a lot of these witch trials. And he was there for his justification was that I need to be there to ensure I can extract wisdom and knowledge from these women about nature's ways so that man could get his rightful position in the universe. So he saw it as a war of conquest, conquest and domination over power over nature, power over the feminine, and that he was calling to unite the scientific community to unite forces against the nature of things, to storm and occupy her castles and strongholds and extend the bounds of human empire. That's his words. And to continue in with his words, nature being known, it may be mastered, managed and used in the services of human life. I am come in very truth, leading you to nature with all her children to bind her to your service and make her your slave. The object of knowledge is the control of nature. Nature in itself has no purpose. So how can we again sit with that? This was not being questioned. This was the truth. And that has been part of the foundation for the scientific revolution. And Descartes, Newton, and many others build on that. And build on this understanding that for us to do scientific work, we need to extract wisdom from the feminine about nature's ways to ensure domination. Descartes said, through science, we can render ourselves the masters and possessors, possessors of nature. And he's also famous for the cogito ergo sum that have caused this destruction of, uh, of, of mind and matter. And this separation between humans and the, the living world that we are superior. We have this power over the rest of the living world. So words and concepts that became forbidden and not just kind of, it's not, it's not good to use these kind of words. It's not really accepted. No, it became forbidden in the way that it would mean the end of your life. If you were approaching science, approaching life in a way where you would use words like spirit, soul, enchanted nature, the feminine, the goddesses, the unconscious, the interconnectedness of life, um, nature being something that is sacred. So with this mindset, we bulldoze our way as Europeans out into the world and we're taking possession over uh, humans and land. And we spread our capitalistic ways. We spread to the rest of the world this worldview of power over 
of um, of nature being something that is at our disposal, something we should dominate, conquer, extract. The feminine being something to dominate, control, or else society will become too wild and will be tempted by devils by the devil's ways. So how can we sit with that? How can we sit with how are these colonial patterns of behavior still showing up today? When we entered out into the world, we were justifying our behavior by in many different ways. One was the concept of vacuum domicilium, this empty space, and that we were in our right to put this wilderness to good and profitable use. We were being good human beings by putting this wilderness to good and profitable use. This is not my words. These are, these are words that are being found in texts from that era. So this was the justification of us venturing out into the world, stealing land and seeing the so-called, what we called the wild ones, as something that we could take into our possession as well, something we could dominate, this power over dynamic, this enslavement of our brothers and sisters. And how can we sit with that? How can we see it as the root cause of racism that is showing up in our societies today as well? This dehumanization that is weaving its way into every corner of our society, unless it stops with us, unless we start to be more conscious of when the story of separation is showing up in our circles of influence. It takes work, it takes dedication to start seeing what we have been brought up and raised to not see, to unsee, to look away. This uneven distribution of wealth, which is still present today, this inequality, this privilege that some people have that others do not and have never had. This stealing of land and this um, eradicating all indigenous people of what made them them. Their whole identities were stripped away. It was not no longer legal for them to sit in ceremony, to practice their ways of being custodians of land. They were forced away from the land that their ancestors, forefathers, had cultivated for thousands of years. Suddenly they were forced away from that, put into small reservations. How can we look that directly in the eye and sit with the fact that it, was, it wasn't just them that got eradicated of something truly sacred. We as a whole got stripped out of a sacred way of being in communion and collaboration with life itself. How can we sit with that? We justified that we had to tame the, these people, make them unwild, that we had to make them more civilized. We are good Christians because of that. That was the story we told ourselves. And this trauma is still present in our societies today. It's something we have to sit with or else we are scaffolding on a fragile, traumatic foundation. It's unpleasant to look in the eye. And there's a lot of white fragility with tooth and nail fighting to be portrayed as the good white person. How can we see this white fertility in ourselves? How can we name it and start to navigate in a new direction, in a new way forward, where we are embracing everything and everyone, celebrating all our bro brothers and sisters and celebrating this wholeness? At the same era, um, couple of centuries into the colonial era, we discovered fossil fuels and fuels, and that just exploded the whole productivity, efficiency, um, epoch, and was really the catalyst of the industrial era. So without this sacred relationship to life itself, 
without the indigenous worldview present. And instead this understanding of the world that we need to dominate nature, we need to extract it. We, we are the rightful um, masters of the world. That was the mindset with which we entered the industrial era where we extracted human and natural resources, focused on efficiency, focused on ownership, focused on productivity, optimization, hierarchy, control, patriarchy, and this mechanistic reductionistic worldview. How can we sit with the fact that that's still present in every fiber of our society today? How can we name it? How can we see that this is a manifestation, the great acceleration, this is a manifestation of the story of separation. And that we don't heal this by adding SDGs and ESGs and a four day work week. We need to go deeper. How yeah. can we breathe into this? So let's take a deep breath, everyone. And just allow what Laura has shared to, to just land into our space and acknowledge that there may be a lot of different emotions present here. I invite you to take that deep breath. Observing your emotions. There may be triggering, there may be fragility, there may be grief, there may be anger, just allowing yourself to, to be present with what is here. Knowing that when we feel, when we acknowledge emotions, that is when we, we heal together. And also acknowledging this particular slide that Laura is showing us right now, the great acceleration, the great acceleration. Just take a moment and perhaps Notice where this word acceleration, acceleration, what that word does to us. And perhaps notice where inside your physical body that word lives in you. Notice if, if there is uh, any nudge any nudge within your physical body around this word acceleration. So just take a deep breath here. So I'm going to take a moment now to, to read some words by the author Tricia Hersey. Tricia Hersey is an African-American author. She's an artist. She's a dreamer, she's a visionary. She is the founder of the NAP ministry. And she recently released a book called Rest is Resistance. And it was immediately a New York Times bestseller. And in her book, Trisha talks about how this interconnected story of separation that Laura has been talking about, the separation from nature, the separation from our indigenous roots and the dreaming mind, the story mind, the creation of white supremacy, paving the way for colonialism and capitalism, the story of separation as, as pronounced in ableism, in classism, the outer versus the inner, the masculine versus the feminine, the left brain versus the right brain, and so on. Trisha Hersey talks about how all of this separation has collectively become grind culture and how we have become grind culture, how we have become this great acceleration ourselves. So I'm going to read from her book, Rest is Resistance, and just notice what comes up for you as I read these words. 
many people believe that grind culture is this pie in the sky monster directing our every move when in reality we become grind culture we are grind culture grind culture is our everyday behaviors everyday expectations and engagements with each other and the world around us we have been socialized manipulated and indoctrinated by everything in culture to believe the lies of grind culture in order for a capitalist system to thrive our false beliefs in productivity and labor must remain we have internalized its teachings and become zombie like in spirit and exhausted in body so we push ourselves and each other under the guise of being hyper productive and efficient from a very young age we begin the slow process of disconnecting from our body's need to rest and are praised when we work ourselves to exhaustion we tell our children to stop being lazy when they aren't participating in work culture with the same intensity as us we lose empathy for ourselves first and push excessively we become managers teachers and leaders who fall prey to the allure of a capitalist system and treat those we have the honor of working with as human machines we become rigid and impatient when our checklist isn't completed to perfection we become less human and less secure we believe that we are only meant to survive and not thrive we see care as unnecessary and unimportant we believe that we don't really have to rest we falsely believe hard work guarantees success in a capitalist system i have been told this consistently for as long as i can remember so let's just take a deep breath here mm it's allowing those words to land Mm. Thank you, Emily. And what the great acceleration does not include is the fact that stress and burnout, depression levels has been through the same steep increase since the 1950s. Every year that Gallup announces their global emotions report the levels have increased from previous years it's all interconnected and what happens when we as the whole use our connection to the greater tapestry of life when we lo lose this sacred approach to our role being stewards and custodians of life itself when we become so disconnected from our natural habitat from our own individual wholeness what happens then to us as a society and how can we start to train our ways of viewing the world viewing the challenges that we are facing in this vuka world with the lens that i can become a healer of this if i heal the story of separation within me and start to see what i have been trained to unsee and not see 
because what happens when we lose our connection to life and lose our connection to our indigenous worldview, we become out of balance, out of kilter. So how can we all go through a process of re-indigenization, reclaiming our own indigenous roots and starting to see this friction that we are navigating as a society as interconnected? And how can we start to see that it's showing up everywhere and it has many different faces, but the roots are the same. It's showing up in some of the images you see here. It's showing up in how we have decided to design <clears throat> like efficient machines, how we grow our food in this monocultural extractive process that is incredibly depleting for the soil, for the skin of our earth. How we put humans into organizations under artificial daylights, into cubicles, and like robots, ask them to tab away all day. It shows up in how we address climate change and try to solve this by a very, very one-dimensional approach. This carbon tunnel vision that you've, some of you may have seen before. It's rearing its head everywhere we look. It's showing up in how we still today call colonized nations developing and those who colonized the developed nations. It's showing up in how we celebrate different qualities in our children, in ourselves, that it's the left brain hemisphere, the rational analytical brain that is the superior brain. And that has dominated how we have designed our educational systems and how we are forcing our children into these machines to come out the other end as efficient little contributors to the machine. It's showing up everywhere. And it can be a fascinating and, 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 and a journey full of grief when we start to, un, to, to see where it's showing up. It's showing up in Disney stories. These are the Disney stories that many of us were, grew up with. These white, beautiful women who were stripping themselves of their own identity to please a man. It was all about their beauty. It was all about letting go of their identity to please a man. This, these are the role models that we were growing up with. Thankfully, it's starting to change. And the kind of Disney role models that you see in many of the films now have changed character, thankfully. But still, these are present today. It's showing up in how we treat little boys in a way where we tell them that boys don't cry or boys will be boys. And it's showing up in, in how we have designed organizational culture to completely be stripped of a cyclical approach to life, something we will talk a lot more about. How can we weave that back in? How can we honor that we are a cyclical being on a cyclical planet? We could go on and on with examples. And that is an important process for us when we want to unlearn, which we have to. We need to start seeing things in a new light so we can claim it, name it, see it, heal it, go through a process of reconciliation. It's not a process that is calling for white spiritualism where we just throw love and light on it and it will pass. We need to go deeper. And this is an important process of the regenerative journey of unlearning and reclaiming wholeness. And that's why it's so important to me. It's not just about being fluent in living systems language or understanding the principles of life and falling in love with biomimicry, which is an important component. But it's more than that. It's understanding why we need to be in communion with life, weave with life, be custodians of life. 
It's a, it's a shift. It's a world shift in our worldview. It is that coming into wholeness. We've talked about homeostasis already, something we will dive much deeper into, this importance of living systems. And us as an organism, the homo sapiens, we can't achieve wholeness and homeostasis unless we individually become whole. The inner will always inform the outer. We need to come back to essence. We need to understand that it's an inner journey. And for us to change systems and structures, which we have to do, because we need to move beyond the inner, and then we need to start to dare raise questions in our circles of influence. And we need to start dare redesigning and holding space for how do we redesign systems and structures and business models in a way where they are serving life, serving wholeness. That is the journey of a regenerator, in my opinion. Questioning everything, letting go of the linear programming, the linear models, and see the interconnectedness of life. Explore your own blind spots and shadows, because we all have them. But convincing ourselves that we don't is, again, the scaffolding on a fragile foundation. And for those of you that require a more analytical process where all what we have been through in this session by now is overwhelming and confusing, confusing. this is just a, a suggestion that you could take any topic that you find is a problem in today's society and you can start to trace back its roots. We've done this here with racism, a quick kind of study of that, not, not in depth, but just to get to, to, to have you get the gist of it. Where did it start? What is the root cause? What is superficial solutioneering? That is civil rights reform. Regardless of that being important, it's not gonna cut it. Diversity and inclusion work as we see in, in organizations today are not gonna cut it unless you are willing to have the deeper conversations. Um, we need systemic change. We need white people that are rolling up their sleeves and intentionally unlearning white supremacy, understanding the shadows of that being white fragility. White fragility being, but I'm a good white person. I'm not a racist. When we are deflecting, instead of going deeper, it can also show up, the shadow can also show up in the white savior complex, where we are abandoning our white brothers and sisters and letting our anger about what has happened and what is happening get the better of us in the sense where we are creating more othering, more friction. How can we hold a new kind of space for this topic where we are healing at the root? The same with the six mass extinction. We're not gonna solve the climate collapse and the six mass extinction with ESGs and SDGs. It's not gonna cut it. It's superficial solutioneering. They can be important components, but if that becomes the laurels upon which we rest and our work is done, we're not gonna cut it. And it's actually in many ways causing more harm. It's slowing us down. If we hide behind, I work towards implementing SDGs, my work is done. I'm, this is good enough. We need to dare go deeper or shadows can come up in the sense that I recycle or we tell each other all kinds of stories. We all do that. So this is not to shame or judge, but this is just trying to offer you a space where we can start to consciously unlearn some of these patterns we are hiding behind. We can only address the sixth mass extinction by truly regenerating land, truly weaving in the logic of life, the principles of life into everything that we do. The same about the pandemic among people that are burned out and stressed. It's not going to fix things that we go on a sick leave 
or that we do nature therapy to be more efficient when we go back to the dysfunctional machine. It's not going to cut it. It's actually making things worse. If we, if we are only doing this to be more efficient and productive when we are inside the machine, the machine needs to be dismantled and we need to redesign in completely new ways based on the logic of life. So we need to sit with the shadows. We need to sit with all of this on this regenerative journey. Where is it showing up in our community? When are we so trained that we enter a space like this in an extractive mindset without being bad people? What can I take from this? What can I learn? And I integrate that into my thing without, um, without doing that content justice. Or how am I treating the siblings on this journey? Am, am I creating othering? Is it a reciprocal or an, or an extractive exchange? How do I view those of you that have been vi invited into a home circle? How are you analyzing them? What can they do for me? Blah, blah, blah. Instead of how can I serve the wholeness of my home circle? How can I understand that all of these human beings they have things for me to learn and sit with. And I'm grateful for them showing up alongside me. Or how do we, for example, approach breakout sessions that we do on our journey? And how can we let go of the perfect student that wants to produce results that can present, be presented? This is not the energy we want in our community. We are holding space for the questions together, sitting with the questions together. And if we have reflections to share, we can do that but it's not a production of content. And how can we, in this collapse that we are surrounded by in the world that we are navigating right now, how can we tune into the cracks of light? How can we see the life that this dying is also bringing along with it? And how can we find the glimpses of new life? How can we hold space for that? How can we surrender to the fact that a lot of things need to die right now and sitting with that to allow new work, new life to be breathed in? So what we will do now is that we will sit in our own space and we will sit in our own space for um, around eight, 10 minutes with these reflective questions before we go out into breakouts to discuss some of these questions. So in silence or with music, whatever you prefer, I will keep the time, tune in to these questions and, and Emily will share them now also in our chat. So don't worry about, about that. In what ways does the story of separation live in and through me? What are some of the concrete examples that you are aware of that springs to mind? Where are you sensing there might be more to become aware of, understand, unlearn, and heal? 